I've got um, fantastic colleagues here who I'm going to invite to respond to that gap um, in terms of how they are thinking about their own work. First, we're going to hear from Shannon Valor, who's the Bailey Gifford Chair in the Ethics of Data and Artificial Intelligence at the Edinburgh Futures Institute at the University of Edinburgh, where she's also appointed in philosophy. And Professor Valor's research explores how new technologies, especially AI, robotics, and data science, reshape human moral character, habits, and practices. After that, we're gonna hear from Evan Selinger, who's professor of philosophy at the Rochester Institute of Technology, where tech ethics, including AI and privacy, are his areas of expertise. And he's a widely published author and his latest book, Re-Engineering Humanity, which was co-authored with Fresh Frischman, was selected as one of the Guardian's best books of 2018. After Evan, we're gonna hear from Dr. Brent Middlestadt, who's a senior research fellow in data ethics at the Oxford Internet Institute, a Turing fellow at the Alan Turing Institute, and a member of the UK National Stat Statisticians Data Ethics Advisory Committee. Brent is a philosopher specializing in digital ethics, bioethics, and ethical governance of algorithmic systems. Uh, and finally, we're gonna hear from Johnny Penn, and Johnny is a technologist, historian, and best-selling author. He's an affiliate at Harvard University's Berkman Klein Center and a doctoral researcher in the history and philosophy of science department at the University of Cambridge. And he's the project development lead on the history of artificial intelligence project at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence at the University of Cambridge. So I'm gonna invite Shannon to start in response to our kind of the provocation that's presented to us by our particular moment in history. How do we explore the gaps between a kind of ethics in the ivory tower and an ethics in practice or a call for ethic, uh, for, for justice as a kind of ethical provocation? Thanks, Shannon, for starting. Great, thanks, Allison. Um, so I think this is a really important question because I think one of the things that we have to recognize is that the idea of ethics that we might be carrying around with us, either in academia or in uh, industry and, and, and government and other settings, um, that those ideas of ethics we are carrying around might themselves be impoverished. And this call to action and call to justice uh, as a provocation is constructive because I think it can help redirect us to what ethics really is um, at the end of the day or, or, or needs to be. So, um, you know, my background in, in virtue ethics is rooted in the notion of ethics as a practice. Um, uh, it's, ethics is not a checklist. Um, ethics is not a box ticking exercise. Um, it's not a set of fixed and complete rules uh, that tell us how to, to act in ways that are guaranteed uh, to be justified. Uh, there's no clear decision procedure. There's no algorithm for ethics that removes risk or uncertainty from moral life. Um, and I think when we come to ethics with an expectation that ethics will give us that certainty um, or that relief from the responsibilities uh, that we carry with us, then we're likely to get this kind of ethics fatigue that, uh, or this sense that, hey, this isn't actually working. We need something else and we need, we need justice. Um, but real ethics is, first of all, anchored in justice. Um, and secondly, is an, an ongoing uh, and open-ended responsibility uh, to carry. Uh, we don't get ethics fatigue or think we're entitled to ethics fatigue in our, in our family life or in our friendships. We don't decide, ugh, Ethics here isn't, isn't giving me a clear and unambiguous uh, instruction on how to behave. So, you know, let's get rid of it. Um, ethics is something that we understand in these other domains uh, is, a, is a light that we are constantly shining on our actions and constantly using in, in self-reflection and, and efforts of self-improvement to align our lives uh, with, with justice, um, uh, uh, with compassion. Um, and I think the same is true in, in tech. Uh, we just need to adopt that richer notion of, of ethics and move forward with it, uh, where ethics is, is a practice of, of justice uh, and, and not uh, an abstract theory. Great, thank you, Shannon. Um, really interesting points there. Um, I'm curious 
to hear more about self-improvement, but I'm going to leave that just for a moment and pass over to Evan to um, to kind of make his opening remarks. Yeah, thanks. And and I love this provocation too, because I think this is something that, you know, whichever field we're in or whichever subfield, it's it's one of the most pressing things to, to think about. Um, I guess my short answer is the way that I think about this, at least for myself, is over time, I've just become less and less based in a single discipline, less and less purely philosophical. I think in order to, to address this gap, uh, a lot of our ethics work has to be informed by pressing real life issues. And we need to be able to translate our insights you know, for practical use. And I think very specifically, that means working directly with uh, NGOs, civil, civil rights, civil liberties organizations, human rights organizations, uh, think tanks that are connected to you know, important policy levers, uh, advancing public scholarship. So these are the things that that I've been heavily working on. You know, just to give two quick examples, and I'm happy to talk about you know these more later if it if it helps. But you know, for for a really long time, uh, a law professor named Woodrow Hartzog and I have been advocating for facial recognition being banned. Uh, this has largely been not just on the basis of abstract ethical ideals, but about the lived realities of marginalized people. We're seeing this especially right now in terms of concerns about identifying protesters. But to do that, that's meant writing in law journals, that's meant you know publishing public op-eds, that's meant working with organizations and writing testimony for the ACLU. So it, it, it's been about trying to take these ideas, but but really express them in philosophical ways, but also you know translate them for action. And one other quick example, which I hope, you know, other people are doing and, and, and are doing in their own way, is I taught a surveillance seminar in the fall, and I have largely technical students, so students with great backgrounds in, you know, engineering and science. And we were reading these high-level discussions about what problems with surveillance are, but one of the most difficult issues is how to think about experiences uh, of disparate impacts that maybe don't reflect my life or even the lives of people in the class. And so to think of it in a public interest model, we, we partnered with two NGOs. We worked with a Stop Surveillance Oversight Committee and Turning Points for Women and Families. And the idea was for my students to be guided by NGOs that could identify pressing needs. In this case, it was for uh, survivors of domestic abuse, uh, particularly in Muslim uh, communities, who were able to ask my students, uh, basically for how to, what to do to prevent uh, not just surveillance in general, but to help this specific group of people not be spied on by their abusers. And this really enabled my technical students to be able to not just uh, provide their expertise in situations they never would have expected, but in being shaped by the communities. They didn't come with um, you know, a built-in set of ideas how to do this, but by working with the communities that they were you know, being asked to provide assistance to, they, they learned in ways that I think a traditional philosophy class probably wouldn't have been able to um, help them do. Thank you, Evan. Um, this idea of, of thinking really practically as well, like through the process of technological development to solve problems that developers don't themselves face, I think is also a very interesting practical provocation. Um, I'm going to pass over to Brent now um, to hear what you have to say in response to this provocation. Okay, well, thanks so much for having me. Um, and thank you for the provocation. I, I think it's really important. Um, I mean, really, we're talking about systems that can be used to make or influence very, very important decisions in people's lives. So talking about things like loan decisions, being admitted to college, uh, being hired, being fired, uh, sentencing decisions in criminal justice. These are really, really important, potentially life-changing de decisions um, on, on people's lives. And for me to decide or to say anything about what is ethical in those contexts, you really have to start to grapple with the sort of day-to-day -day lived experiences of the people that are actually being affected by these systems. I mean, I've argued elsewhere the context is absolutely essential whenever we are talking about ethics. And I think it's it's starting to be widely recognized now that our greatest challenge that we face um, is to bring the ethical frameworks, the principles that we have down to the ground and to actually get basically the right people around the table to make sure that these principles are being, let's say, interpreted um, and influencing AI development in the right way, in a way that actually reflects the values of, of the people, not just that are designing the systems, but the people that are being affected by them. And we're certainly not there yet in terms of having the right voices around the table. 
Um, but to me, even once we have you know the right people around the table, that's not going to be enough by itself. I feel like um, to really start to bridge the gap between ethics and this transformative sense of justice that we're experiencing now, um, we need to start thinking about how these systems not just how we can make it so that they don't make things worse than they already are or make the world less just or less fair than it is already, but rather how we can use them to make the world fair, how we can use them as a sort of critical mirror so we can start to recognize the biases that we have in our decision making and the biases that exist in our data because you know data reflects the world as it is. The world is a biased place, so of course our, our data is, is biased as well. So it's about it's about finding, using these systems to find those biases, to detect how they're being baked into our decision-making models. Um, and really we have an opportunity here because these systems could potentially be fully transparent, at least in principle. We can start to look closely at the prejudices that exist in decision-making, hopefully start to eliminate them. And I, I think that they are an extremely powerful tool for understanding our own biases and our own prejudices um, better and therefore to start to make society more just. And I really like the point that was raised earlier, ethics not being a checklist, that it's a practice. I think something else we need to think hard about is what responsibilities, what duties do we want the, the people, the companies developing these systems to have going forward? Um, I really like the idea of thinking of AI developers as types of moral practitioners where they, they should perhaps have fiduciary duties to the people uh, that are actually being affected by their systems. Um, so that's, that's some, of, um, some of where I'm coming from in terms of this provocation. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Brent. This question about responsibilities is also a very interesting one because there are questions about the extent to which individuals might be able to exercise responsibilities and also questions about the extent to which different entities, companies, uh, governments, third parties, self-certification bodies might also be able to um, exercise um, different levels of responsibilities. And we don't have an answer for who should exercise which. Um, so I'm gonna turn to Johnny and then we'll get into the sort of juicy details of the conversation. <clears throat> Yes, thank you for inviting me today. Um, my perspective is informed by the fact I'm a historian of technology. Um, so much of what I grapple with are the kind of narratives that surround technology, artificial intelligence um, over time. And I can't help but notice in, in the provocations from um, my fellow panelists here, there's kind of a reoccurring theme about the limits of academic pursuits. It's, uh, you know, I've heard that you know, re recognizing that ethics in the popular imagination is kind of a standardized solution uh, for problems, as Shannon told us, that's, you know, that's not, be, be wary of that j jump, that leap uh, in the popular imagination because ethics is actually not standardized. There's, there aren't, it's not a panacea for things like text shortcomings. Um, and um, as uh, Evan said about, um, Academic models. I can't read my notes here, but um, I guess Brent and 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 Evan both underlined the, the need to kind of engage with people in the community. Brent used the expression on the ground. You know, who who are the communities that are actually affected by things like surveillance, and how can we incorporate them into understanding of uh, how to mitigate the harms caused by these tools? And for me, that underlines a kind of reoccurring uh, position. I've um, found myself taking just from looking at these things historically, which is that academic academia itself uh, is complicit in, 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 in broader systems that we are feeling the impacts of um, now. And I, I wanna be mindful of the word we, uh, because even in the, in the description of this panel, it, you know, the, the words we use, we've all hoped that this would be the last panel we've attend. Who are we? <laughs> you know, the, the, there's a very small niche group of people that have the interests, the, the full-time pursuits that we have. Uh, and I'm using we there as kind of this group and maybe the people attending, but I want to be mindful of, as Shannon warned us around ethics, also not casting uh, the opinions that we have uh, or academics have is somehow representative of the population at large. Because I think what we're seeing in this moment uh, in the States, especially is that um, the, the so-called leaders uh, are, are very different uh, groups that are, that, are, that are traditionally recognized. Um, I have a friend that works uh, in uh, against um, 
um, uh, surveillance and, and kind of advanced decision system tools in California. And they say, you know, academics actually cause more problems than they solve often in the work that they do because they represent, they, they claim to represent our interests when actually they're not affiliated with us. Uh, and so that's why um, the sort of uh, maneuvers that my fellow panelists have mentioned, I, I just want to, I guess, reassert is, is very important. Um, and to just close, you know, my, my interest, uh, one of my main interests in this space of ethics, I guess, is just uh, delegitimizing people's claims to the future because AI itself as a category has strong claims to what the future is going to be. The future in that kind of ideal is you know, we're moving towards progress. It is imminent. Uh, it is accumulated. We are going somewhere. Uh, and that may be true for the we who have those discussions, but uh, often um, it's not true for people that uh, are marginalized and will just be further marginalized by this kind of tech, uh, this march towards progress. So um, I think in this discussion today, I just want to decouple AI from the future and, and, and mark that as a claim and mark that as an assumption that we have to use these tools, that these tools are somehow de facto beneficial. We do have the choice, as, as uh, Evan mentioned, to just prohibit things like uh, facial recognition and perhaps far more of uh, the sort of tool sets that, that fall under the banner of AI. Um, and I am an adv increasingly an advocate for uh, taking back control of our future. Uh, uh, from from these kind of presumptuous and often industry-led uh, notions of technology and AI and stuff like that. But that's a whole wasp mess. We can dig into it as you guys like. Uh, that's just kind of the sort of things I'm interested in. Great. Well, thank you to everyone for um, kind of responding to my provocation. Um, and I think what I want to draw on actually is to think a little bit about um, who is responsible and how should we position responsibility as, a, as a, an aspect of ethics? Um, as we try to negotiate a future that doesn't have this claim of progress. And I also teach futures, um, Johnny, and I'm really conscious of this idea that the, the idea of a perfect future is an idea and it can be captured quite easily by different groups of people. So I wanted to start with a question about um, how to anchor ethics and justice, practically speaking, um, and to build a little bit on Shannon's idea of, uh, of a kind of um, a virtuous, um, virtuous actions that can improve. So let's assume that, that we have people within the technology industry who want to improve the situation. But this is a question about how we're going to get there. And what I'd like to hear from the panel is, for example, um, we, we have heard that there is uh, the capacity for um, contact tracing technology that we've been hearing about as a way to um, understand the COVID-19 pandemic and to, and to limit the number of people who, uh, who transmit um, the, the uh, um, coronavirus. We have heard that this is being reused as a way of tracking and tracing people who participate in demonstrations, uh, such as the ones that we've experienced around the world in the last week in support of, um, of uh, Black Lives. So who should make a decision about the reuse of what kind of technology? And I'd really like to hear what all of the panelists think and how should we balance the risks of non-virtuous development of this technology? Um, so um, shall we just go through the same order again and, and hear from everyone? Sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, so uh, you've identified a lot of things that I think we can dig into. So I'm going to try to, uh, to keep this brief. But I think one of the things we have uh, hinted at, and I think um, Johnny so far has gotten closest to identifying this issue, is that um, ethics is not uh, and cannot be uh, apolitical. Uh, it, it need not be partisan, but it's always political in the sense that um, you can't really uh, grasp what ethics is about unless you're talking about power, and, and power is part of responsibility, um, and also legitimacy of that power. Um, so asking those we questions is also asking, what power do I have? Uh, how am I using it in ways that impact others who don't share that power? And do I rightfully 
have that power? Am I entitled, even under uh, the best intentions, even with benevolent aims, am I entitled to use this power in this way? Is it right that I have this power and that the people uh, whose lives will be transformed by the way I use it uh, do not have the, the power or the, or the say? And so I think when we talk about this in a case like contact tracing, uh, we need to recognize um, who currently has the power to make those decisions because as Johnny said, it isn't the universal we. And so the legitimacy question, um, who has a legitimate right uh, to make these decisions, I, I think can be quite clarifying because there's a, there's a a saying that I know many of you are familiar with that has become uh, increasingly uh, useful in these contexts. Um, it's been used in, in the context of disability advocacy. Uh, it's been used in the context of, um, of, of uh, technology and race. It's been used in the context of um, uh, the ability uh, of uh, public-private partnerships to dictate what a smart city is going to look like or where it's going to be. And that phrase is nothing about us without us. Uh, and I think that that phrase helps clarify that before we start deciding what our responsibilities are, we need to look at the power that we are wielding and whether uh, we have legitimately uh, uh, acquired that power, um, shared that power in, uh, in legitimate and just ways. And if not, how we can address that before we start taking upon ourselves the responsibility to dictate for others what risks they will be exposed to um, uh, uh, in exchange for which kinds of benefits. And we don't see that happening around uh, COVID-19. We see governments, we see private companies deciding for people uh, what is in their long-term interest and what is interest of, uh, in the interests of, uh, of their health and, and safety. And I think we need to start by making clear where uh, the power is already unjustly distributed and beginning to rectify those imbalances uh, before we start freely exercising uh, what we take to be our responsibilities simply because we happen uh, to have this, uh, uh, this power. That's totally fascinating, Shannon. I mean, the idea of legitimacy um, and also this, this particular ethical balancing act that we're all currently involved in where the legitimacy of, a, of for example, government power to, to uh, prevent certain actions uh, um, and limit certain freedoms is really something that we're all feeling um, very much as being at stake, but very differentially. So Evan, do you have an, a comment on the sort of second provocation? I, I do, so I'll, I'll be quick and I'll, I'll deal with two very specific things to make this concrete. So Shannon mentioned power quite a bit. So I wanna focus two comments on that. And the first is a bit of context, I think. You know, cl clearly one of the biggest players in this space has been, you know, sort of Apple and Google. And much has been made of the fact that they put aside their rivalry. Uh, initially, they were talking about it as contact tracing and eventually realized that was not necessarily the right uh, framing for this and started calling it exposure notification. But here's the point about power I wanna make. Because distrust of not only uh, corporate, but government actors has become, you know, so pronounced these days. In a sense, that partnership was doomed from the start for the following reasons. It was sort of a double bind that, that based on past conduct, almost inevitably uh, led to one place, which was that, you know, in order to avoid the criticism that they were not caring about privacy, Apple and Google really dug into privacy. So they said, we're gonna use Bluetooth, we're not gonna go with GPS, we're not gonna have sort of centralized storage of information. And if they didn't go in that direction, they would have been slammed for not caring about privacy, especially Google, given all the privacy problems in the past. So in leaning into this, of course, they get criticized for not really exercising their power judiciously because the alternative criticism became, you're setting a single standard and there's very good reasons potentially to have more flexible arrangements that maybe there are better ways of providing assistance to healthcare workers. Maybe centralized databases in some contexts are actually worth thinking through. You're foreclosing this. It, it, it is sort of a repeat of the problem that we've seen with setting speech standards before, which was, you know, given the scale and scope of your power and the fact that you're going to be crowding out alternatives by choosing to emphasize privacy at the expense of flexibility, 
this is sort of unfair power mongering and standard setting. And I'm not gonna say that there's an easy way out of that bind, but that is a bind about distrust and it's a bind about fears of abuses of power that are all absolutely grounded legitimately in history leading up to this. So that's my first point about power. And the second point is you asked directly about what are we to make of the fact that uh, data is being used or repurposed for non-medical reasons. I mean, this is exactly another major source of fear and distrust that's absolutely been you know, hampering these initiatives. So on the one hand, we have lots of legislation in the US. We have Republican legislation, we have Democratic legislation being proposed for how to deal with issues like data collection and data storage and data repurposing. But one of the things that Frankly, none of this does a sufficiently good job of addressing, I think this is a major sticking point about power, is as we're building and expanding the infrastructure to deal with emergencies now, to go back to you know one of the technologies that I've been tracking, there's so much emphasis being placed on, let's expand the use of facial recognition technology, this is gonna help with the pandemic. The real issue is gonna be what happens when this stuff not only outlives the immediate data collection, but when this infrastructure comes to be repurposed, it's much, much harder due to lock-in effects. And since we're dealing with absolutely like atrophied budgets all around, there's gonna be such an incentive to make maximum use of infrastructure that exists, particularly if it can minimize transaction costs. So that's where I see a lot of the power issues at stake, not just in what we decide now, but how they're gonna be lingering post the pandemic. Yeah, this is a real challenge because, of course, you know, you'd want to say, let's have lots of public oversight, let's have lots of civic oversight, let's have lots of ethical reflection um, about these long term consequences. And all of this has to happen in a sort of extremely pressurized environment with other actors calling, for example, to solve the pandemic by rolling out some new technology to kind of allude once again to sort of Johnny's promise, um, you know, claims on, on the future, claims on the efficient future. Um, so Brent, do, do you have uh, your response? Um, yes, I do. I mean, it, it touches on a lot of the same points uh, that, that Evan uh, just raised, so I'll, I'll keep it relatively brief. Um, but I think power is the right framing here. And I find the, the reuse of the technology for surveillance purposes incredibly frustrating, incredibly short-sighted, because you only get one shot at contact tracing and doing it right. And if you reuse the tech right away for surveillance, then you lose that trust that's essential for widespread usage. And so you, you end up losing the potential public health benefits of the system. And I think it is short-sighted to think that rolling out a new piece of tech is suddenly going to solve things in terms of uh, the the pandemic, but you can see how it could potentially uh, have some some utility. I mean, and to turn more to sort of who's responsible for that, who's responsible for limiting reuse, but just for designing the tech in general. Uh, I think Evan was absolutely right to to talk about the position that Apple and Google found themselves in. You can understand why. Um, they designed their expo exposure notification API the way they did, um, the sort of prioritization they gave to privacy. But there's very clear costs to that in terms of efficacy. There's very clear costs in terms of how it actually links in with manual contact tracing. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a point at which it is, let's say, easy or effective to make the decision. If you design the tech a certain way and limit certain things or prevent certain things, uh, data being shared, for example, from happening, then that's a very powerful decision. But that doesn't necessarily make the right decision. You could have, of course, policymakers introduce clear sort of legal constraints or frameworks, but that is going to depend a lot on the trust that people have in, in government. It doesn't particularly help with government surveillance, of course. And I'm sympathetic also to individual developers in this case, because as an individual developer, if you're part of a team developing a complex system, it's very difficult to see the effects of the decisions that you make. It's very difficult to see, to have that feedback loop that lets you know that the decision you made in designing the system eventually had you know, X effect for Y people. And so that's why transparency, openness to external scrutiny, auditing of these systems is absolutely essential. So it, who's responsible for these sorts of things for reuse? It, it has to be shared among the different actors. Thank you very much, Brent. Johnny, do you want to come in? Sure, yeah. I um, Again, I, I, I'm going to try, it's slightly, it's related, but a slightly different perspective. Um, you know, studying artificial intelligence 
you have a pretty clear view of uh, where focus lands and focus tends to land on the outcome of AI. And so we think of it as this kind of fabulous tool because of the certain kind of analytical um, things it allows. But what we don't tend to focus on is all the work that goes into getting to the point that you can do that analysis. And it's often structuring an environment and formalizing uh, people's behaviors in ways that allow you to surveil or to study them uh, and, and, and judge their behaviors. And this is how we get things like the surveillance state. You know, it's, it's uh, the, the two stories are one that, you know, credit scores were the uh, form of acceptable discrimination that, that, that led into uh, the point in time where a company like Facebook can start monitoring our behavior in, in new ways that start to scare us, but are actually not new uh, really in the scheme of things at all. Um, and I guess the reason I say that is because when we talk about who is responsible for AI, you know, talking about ethics, we've already kind of accepted that the system that we're using AI, you know, we're trying to say, okay, well, if we're going to do it. We want it to be ethical. Uh, and I'm, I just want to uh, kind of uh, question that again. Um, both, both points are important, but I think we tend to forget that we have that choice. Um, and to answer your question specifically of who is responsible, I would say three things. The first is, uh, you know, the, the kind of quote unquote AI ethics community as a whole uh, are taking on much of that work currently. I think that uh, tech companies, if they paid their tax, uh, then these people could be paid better and could do better work. Uh, it frustrates me that a lot of um, people in the AI ethics community, you know, PhD students who are going into debt to to take on a career pushing back on on tech companies' failures. And if you if you thought about like if if Facebook were building microwaves and they kept exploding in people's houses, and it was you know, and and students had to take out loans to fight back, saying, hey, these microwaves keep exploding. Uh, can we you know can we do this differently? Really, the government should step in and say, OK, Facebook, you're not allowed to sell a microwave until it doesn't explode in someone's home. And if, if you don't know how to do that, then you can pay those people scholarships and they can go and do that work. Um, and I guess what I'm saying is like testing these things on the public should come at an expense. The tech, the tech companies uh, should be responsible for some of those or much of those expenses, in my view. Second thing is for academics, to Shannon's point about um, legitimacy and authority in, in, in judging, adjudicating some of these decisions, I think we need to start thinking uh, about how to decolonize universities because universities and acad academia in the West is not going to be a trustworthy base, base until we've started to look at our own history uh, and, and the sort of power that we claim in the world today. And de the de decolonization is a multifaceted project, but until we start uh, listening to the people calling for that, uh, I think our, our uh, claim to trust is, 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 is deservingly questioned. Um, and yeah, I guess the, the final or second point about who is responsible, you know, this is all happening within uh, late capitalism and the idea that, that getting AI right will, will start to sort out a bunch of other problems that are attributed to it, I think is, is a false hope. Uh, so when we talk about AI and we talk about power, we need to kind of decouple it from AI because it's often draws our focus to the wrong things, uh, you know, and, and the, the thing, the problems that we try to solve with technology are not technological problems, they're social problems. And I, I will end with a provocation just saying, I, I wonder sometimes if we stopped using AI and we stopped talking about technology today and reinvested that interest, that money, that attention into social problems, I bet they would probably be fixed before uh, the, the kind of technological plus ethics uh, solution. If we just invested in hospital beds instead of contact tracing or decent governance instead of uh, the kind of techno science, techno bureaucracies that we're building now. Um, I offer that provocation, but uh, I'll let the, I've seed the floor. Well, I mean, I think I think I want to take your provocation uh, because I think I want to ask us all about, um, you know, what is it that we're really concerned with when we're doing this work? I mean, all of us, myself included, will talk about ourselves as doing work on ethics in relation to technology. So what does that mean for us to say we're working on technology? And I will I'll just frame this by telling a story from my own years as a PhD student and I was going for a hike with my friend and I said to him I wonder what I would be studying if I were studying in the 14th century and and I said you know I think I would probably be studying God because that's what everybody was worried about in the 14th century 
Um, so I'm really interested, when you are trying to study the ethics of technology, what do you think you're really digging into? Um, and particularly AI, this idea that there's something that might learn and that might contribute something to us as humans or something to us beyond humans. Um, what is it that you're really up to? Uh, Alison, you want me to go ahead and start? Or sure, just go start? ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm kind of going to offer a, a counter provocation, which is um, I think one of our challenges is that we think of ethics as something um, that is a, a domain of, of values, considerations that's imposed upon a neutral subject, which is uh, technology. So when we talk about the ethics of technology, I already worry that we're framing this in the wrong way. Um, and when we think about the fact that technology is already intrinsically imbued with moral and political value judgments, um, both explicit and implicit, as well as uh, effects on uh, the ways that society sees the world, interacts with the world, different groups interact. Um, the ethics in a way is already in the technology. What we haven't done is uh, take an appropriately critical lens to looking at the ethical and political dimensions of technology that are already there. I think we also have to recognize that ethics itself is a technique. It's a evolved technique for living well together um, in a complex and changing and sometimes threatening environment. Um, and so my way of approaching these things as a researcher is not to take technology as the object to which I'm applying ethics as a lens, but to see ethics as a way of making explicit what's already there in technology and then beginning to think about what we want to be there. Um, and thinking about, again, who is the we that gets to say we want this. Um, but I think, I, I think Johnny is quite right that we, we need to remember that um, technologies are not uh, fate, they are human choices and designs, uh, just as our political systems, our economic systems, our systems of language and art are human created and generated ways of building our values into the world. So I don't think we can say, well, let's not use technology. It's the question of which kinds of technologies. And AI may or may not be the right technology to apply in a number of these contexts. Um, but we always need techniques for building uh, the world uh, to be one that we can live in uh, sustainably and well. Uh, and I think those involve social and political techniques like ethics, um, as well as scientific uh, and uh, engineer engineering techniques and design techniques. Thank you so much. So if we're sticking to the same order, I'll, I'll just jump in real fast. So I, I loved your question. So if your question was about if you were to focus on God in the 14th century, what would it be now? I don't want to answer the now in a super broad sense, but in the specific sense of what's happening now after multiple pandemics. And I think for me, the issue of studying technology is basically about recognizing the following. You know, under neoliberalism, we were heavy on privatization and very limited in terms of the welfare state. And now as a result of COVID, we're going to be dealing with deep austerity measures that are going to be encouraging like hyper lean production everywhere. And due to all of the protests that are going on, I think, unfortunately, you're going to be seeing a lot of reactionary forces that are going to be worried about actually all of the positive change that could come out of that. And so for me, studying technology probably in the months ahead is really going to mean looking how society is going to be pushed to use automation to be re-engineered in the following ways. There's going to be hyper pushes in terms of job displacement. Those conversations about what jobs are going to be available in X amount of time are going to be on an accelerated course right now as every company, every institution is going to be trying to do less for more. And I think we need to be hyper vigilant about who's getting pushed out. I think this is going to mean increased surveillance around the board. I think we need to be especially worried about that. And I think the perennial issue of you know false senses of solutionism, which sort of alludes to you know, what Johnny asked us to think about before, this idea that we can sort of strip out other alternatives, maybe even more basic alternatives, like, I don't know, PPE and other kinds of things, uh, are gonna be coming to the fore. And so I think being concerned about those three dimensions, increased job loss, increased surveillance, and the false promise of uh, solutionism, those are the three trajectories for me, at least. And when I think about technology and ethics in the upcoming months, those are gonna receive the most attention. 
Thank you so much, Evan. So I have I have um, one minute for each of um, Brent and Johnny to kind of come in. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, yeah, I'll be quick about it. I mean, so the reason that I study AI ethics and and what interests me about it is it's the fact that we're designing technologies that at least in principle could augment or replace any type of human expertise and do things that humans have traditionally been the only ones that could do. I think there's going there's really really significant um, knock-on effects from that in terms of how we interact with each other, how we understand the world, and just how we envision, let's say, the good life. And to me, that is the central question of ethics. Um, I think a lot of the ethics fatigue that we've seen lately has been because we're going back to that original question of what is the good life, when in fact the answers we want are more about you know what is the right thing to do in this particular situation. And it's understandable that that's where we've gone because it's easier to discuss the theoretical and the abstract issues. It's less political, there's fewer trade-offs, there's fewer risks to doing that. So the push to the abstract is completely uh, reasonable, but really we need to think about how can ethicists be facilitators of critical discussion at a local level? How do you amplify the voices of the people that actually have practical wisdom and are really the ones that should be making the decision about what is right in a particular situation with a particular technology? All right, Johnny, the, the, the final word of this section is yours. Thank you. And thank you to my panelists, the fellow panelists. This has been a really interesting session. I, I, I would conclude, but to answer your question, what are we working on? I, I think of myself as a theoretical bureautician. I do theoretical bureaucracy. Uh, it is called AI now. Um, it was called different things in the past. But in order to render the sort of things we're doing with these advanced decision systems, you need, as I said before, you know, 90% of the work precedes that final step. And, and we should think about that, that 90% and how we're ordering our society to measure it and who loses out. Um, you know, I like the expression, um, surveillance for the rich and, and, and no surveillance for the poor, um, privacy for the poor. I think that uh, to go back to your initial question of who is responsible, we mustn't forget that two thirds of the world's wealth is going to be in the control of 1% of the global population by 2030. So as these spats, as Evan rightly notes about austerity and things like that, I think these these fights will lead us against, uh, you know, people will fight at the same level instead of looking up and noticing where many of the resources that should be available have gone. Uh, and I hope that change will come. Uh, and yeah, this has been a really good session. Uh, thank you for, for having me. Well, we'll have questions in just a moment. Thank you so much, everyone. That was a fascinating discussion. I think that it takes a lot of guts uh, to say at an AI conference that we should take all the funding dedicated to AI and put it in elsewhere. So uh, I think that that's probably the only time that's been said in any one of the many hundreds of panels today. But thank you for, for that and a range of other provocations. Um, I, for one, learned a lot and I really appreciate your time. Um, to the audience, thank you for joining us today. Please do stick around for the Q&A with these excellent panelists. Uh, that will start in about 15 minutes and you can find the Q&A link um, in the COGEX portal if you um, just look for Q&As related to this session. Um, the panelists will be looking forward to taking your questions. And um, this is the concluding voice from the Ada Lovelace Institute. We are signing off. The Ethics and Society stage will be back again tomorrow, of course, with a range of other um, exciting content for you. But thank you for joining us. We really appreciate um, your attendeeship today and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.